proceeding. Jesus almost always tells stories with surprise endings. Nearly all of his parables have a big reversal or an unexpected twist. Sometimes Jesus tells us exactly what the twist is. For example, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Or another one, whoever loves their life will lose it, but whoever hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. A big surprise. It's backwards from what you would expect. In other stories, the surprise is woven into the narrative. And here's one you'll recognize. Once upon a time, a man had two sons. The first son was loyal and worked hard, but the younger son demanded the value of his inheritance be paid to him and then left to squander every cent on selfish desires until he was poor and desperate. When the younger son returned humiliated to his father's house, he intended to throw himself on his father's mercy and beg for a position as a servant. But his father saw him coming down the road and ran to meet him, overcome with relief and love. He threw his arms around his son, kissed his cheek, and held him close. When the younger son began the humble speech of repentance that he'd been practicing along the way, his father ignored him and called for a feast to be given crying out, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now is found. The twist to that parable is a beautiful one. All of us listening expect the father to be angry, but instead he welcomes his son home with joy. It's probably my favorite of all of Jesus' parables, both for this moment and the moment with the elder son, but that's a different sermon. Other parables, like the one Jesus tells today, don't seem to have a happy ending. Today, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son and proceeds to describe how the king sent slaves out to those who had been invited, but for some reason, the guests refused to come. So the king sent more slaves out with details. Look, the delicious food is ready. The table is set. Come on to the banquet. Still, the wedding guests laughed off this invitation and left. One guest went home, another guest went back to work, and the rest of the guests seized the slaves who had brought the invitation and killed them. The king was enraged and sent troops to punish the murderers and burn their city. The king turned to his remaining slaves and said, the wedding feast is ready, but the guests were not worthy. Go out into the streets and invite everyone you can find. The slaves obeyed, and the banquet hall was full of guests, both good and bad. This would have been a nice place to end the story, <laughs> I think, as the, as the preacher. It's an, already a nice reversal. The wedding guests are both good and bad, just people from the streets joining the celebration. The murderers face justice. The son finally has guests to come to his wedding. The banquet hall is full of just regular people. But Jesus' parable doesn't end there. It continues. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe and said, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? The man said nothing, and the king said, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus concludes his parables with one of his well-known sayings, for many are called, but few are chosen. And Episcopalian preachers everywhere dread dealing with any parable that ends with weeping and gnashing of teeth. We really do, and I am not an exception. We don't like these stories because we believe in a loving God who welcomes home the prodigal son and forgives him. The wedding banquet parable is more confusing and the violence in it is upsetting. The wedding guests are the one who initiate this violence, inexplicably killing the king's slaves when they arrived with invitations. The king responds with violence to destroy the murderers and burn their cities. When one guest comes in without a wedding robe, the king calls him friend. But when the man has no response, the king has him thrown out. So what in the world do we make of this parable? Jesus started it by saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. 
So the question in many of Jesus' parables is, where is God? Does the king represent God? In some ways, it works. God is inviting people to his son's wedding feast, and the church has traditionally been called the bride of Christ. We might feel comfortable comparing the king in this story to God at first, even when the king punishes murderers, because we like to think of God as just. But when the king throws out the guest, who for reasons unknown didn't have the right clothing, it starts to feel icky. Maybe this man from the street doesn't have a wedding robe. Maybe it was the king's responsibility to provide one, since these guests hadn't originally been invited and hadn't been planning to attend a royal wedding. So why does this mistake lead to the man being thrown out into darkness? Some professors and scholars urge us to consider different ways of reading the parables, citing Jesus' tendency to reverse expectations. What if the king is not God, but the church? What if we are the ones inviting people to a wedding banquet for the Son of God and reacting with anger when they do not come, involving ourselves in violence in Jesus' name, or shunning people when they do not look or act the way we think they should? This reversal works because Jesus consistently told us the kingdom of heaven is here with us now, rather than simply an afterlife waiting for us when we die. So which is the right way to read the parable, or is it something different entirely? I'm comfortable telling you I don't know. (laughs) Many people smarter than me, with much more education than me, still don't agree. We're not sure exactly what Jesus intended when he told this story, nor why Matthew's version of the wedding banquet is different from the more gentle version in the Gospel of Luke, where there's no weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thousands of years of preachers and professors haven't come to agreement, so we probably won't figure it out today. So what then are we supposed to learn about the kingdom of heaven from this confusing parable? What might Jesus want to teach us about God or ourselves? First, we remember that parables aren't quite the same as allegories. The comparisons aren't as clean. The metaphors don't have to line up exactly in a parable. They might teach us more than one thing, depending on which angle we take and what perspective we look at them from. Still, I have a few theories. I think if the king in this story does represent God, then there's one single thing that stands out more than anything else, and that is how passionately, how desperately the king wants people to attend the feast, how hard the king works to invite people. God loves us, loves all people so much all the time and deeply desires that we come home that we accept the invitation to take our ease and celebrate in God's presence. But like the wedding guests, we so often find something else that's more important, some other distraction or obligation, some other argument to win, that we may refuse the invitation. In this way, the final line of the parable might more accurately be this. Many are called, but few choose to answer because we are the ones who do the choosing. If the king represents us inviting others into God's family, we are the ones who choose how we will react if our invitation is rejected. Will we respond with disdain or even violence? Will we respond with love? If the king represents God inviting us all to a banquet, we are the ones who choose whether or not to accept. The king's invitation went out to any and all people that could be found. Will we choose to accept God's invitation? The invitation comes every day. Every moment is another chance to say yes. The table is set. The invitations are out. And all are welcome at God's table. Amen.